continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon the message this afternoon. Father, it is fascinating to me this afternoon to think that an almighty, all sovereign God would want to communicate, would want me, would want us to have um, a relationship with you. You've opened ways for us to communicate to you, uh, communicate with you. You even give us commandments to pray without ceasing. But Lord, we fail. And as we open this chapter now, we find that Paul is bringing this issue, this topic, on the table once again. Not only will he command us to pray, to watch, and to be thankful in our prayers, but he also wants us <coughs> to pray for each other. And Lord, so that we explore, explore this topic, or uh, reach out to this topic once again, I pray that you will help us understand where we stand and remove the, the, the changes that need to be produced. I pray that you will help me uh, be faithful to scriptures and bring it across. I pray that you will give me utterance from the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit might be the one to put all these uh, ideas together and help me with my English. It is hard for me sometimes to uh, put my ideas, sometimes they come in Spanish, and then <coughs> comes the problem of having to uh, interpret them in, in English. But Lord, it seems like every time I've depended on you, you may know the difference, and I pray that you will do it again. Be well, be, be with all of us, Father, and understand where, why Paul is bringing this point now after bringing the other commandments of uh, the commandments for the family for the uh, for the for the husband for the wife for the for the for fathers for children why why now this verse and again i think it's related we find it so hard to obey you in the family um of businesses and in the the social um uh, areas and and then here we find that we're not alone. We, we don't have to fight this battle, these battles alone. We always have you. And so Lord, help us be able to understand why now Paul comes in with prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Very simple verse. Just like all the other ones. Have you noticed the other commandments are not difficult? Uh, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, up to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord, and he does this for the husbands, for the children, for the fathers, and later on with the servants. And now, uh, we open chapter 4, he continues with uh, something that's very difficult to do, masters give up to your servants and that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And when you look at this, and remember the questions that I've raised, uh, why is it so difficult? Well, you know, we don't have to do it alone. So pray, I, I don't know if Paul was thinking, they're going to be asking this question all along. So I'm going to give them the secret weapon. Pray. Very simple. Three things I'd like to pick up from this verse. <clears throat> Continue. Now that's the one I have most difficult with because I can pray, for sure, every day I pray. But to be in a state of prayer, Never breaking the connection of communication with God, that I find difficult. Then we find another word there, watch. Um, and then the last one with thanksgiving. Now again, this doesn't come in, in an empty shell. This, this, is, this, this, this is all interconnected. If you remember, we looked at chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. That spoke about salvation. Then uh, Paul moves into verses 5 through 8, and he uses this word, mortify, therefore. And he goes on to tell us about things that we need to put off and things that we need to put on. So this section, verses 5 through 8, is about separation. 
Then in verse 9 through 15, he uh, starts talking to us about sanctification. And then the way this all happens in verse 16 is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so we see saturation. Very important doctrines that we need to understand. And then Paul makes several specific applications, and, these, uh, and those applications, of course, comes in the, the area of duties. Wives, submit. Husbands, love. Your wives without bitterness. Children, obey your parents in all things. Parents, uh, refrain from provoking your children, servants, to obey their masters in singleness of heart. And then masters, to treat their servants justly as fellow humans. You know, you, you look at this and you think, um, and, and I, I tend to talk to Paul, and you know, when I'm studying this, and I kind of sit back in my, my office, in my chair, and I think, Paul, uh, how's this done, since it's so difficult? And I try to have a conversation with him, of course, he doesn't answer. <laughs> if he did, then you'd be worried about this pastor. <laughs> You know, and the answer comes like to this way. The devil doesn't want you to fulfill any of these responsibilities and duties. And so understanding this, you see that the Holy Spirit had Paul turn his attention to the instructions that we need. So in order to help us flesh out these applications, his first instruction deals with absolute necessity of prayer and precaution. You need to be praying all the time. And you need to be cautious as you pray. And you need to be thankful when you pray. A few months ago, I my kids, uh, 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 had the kids build this tree. We call it the, the tree of thank, uh, and, and the, the tree of uh, thanksgiving. And the tree of thanksgiving. And I encourage folks to write, you know, on leaves that we had around there, to write something that they were thankful for, a blessing that God had um, given them. And <clears throat> it hasn't blossomed very well. We have about eight or nine of them. It should be falling apart with the, with the weight of the leaves. So as I was looking at that this morning, I said, we really need this message. We really need it. So, as I look at this verse, I thought, well, I, I can't seem to find three points. I only find two, so I've got a problem. <laughs> Brother Tim is laughing because he knows I like the three points um, <laughs> method. <clears throat> but I only see two, and, and what I see here this afternoon, first I titled the message, Prayer and Precaution. And then the two points that I think Paul is emphasizing here will be, you know, it doesn't stop there because in verse 3 it goes on talking to us how we should be praying for others. We'll uh, touch on that uh, separately. But here I see two points, prayer, that is continue in prayer. And we will see this afternoon that this is not a suggestion, this is not an option, this is a command. Just like the one before. To the husbands, to the wives, the, the, the Paul is bringing in this tool now that he calls prayer to help us be able to function properly in the other areas that he's mentioned before. So he gives us a command. You won't be able to manage those areas in your life, in your, in your family, in your marriage, unless you put the Lord in the middle. And he says, don't do this only on Monday or on Sunday. You need to do, do this on Monday and Tuesday. By the way, all the time. If you're like me, uh, as soon as you bring your guard down, but it gets on me and says something that I feel like getting in the flesh for. <laughs> so I need to pray. Five minutes later, I'm in the same situation again. I need to pray again. It doesn't seem like I need to pray as much now as then maybe 40 years ago when I was just recently married. I used to pray a lot then. <laughs> I understood the necessity to continue in prayer. But you know, even though 43 years have gone by, I realize that the, the more, you know, when, I, when I, I don't emphasize prayer in my marriage, then things start going wrong. 
So I'd like to concentrate part of this message on this word, continue. And then the precaution, watch in the same with thanksgiving. So we have to be precautious as we pray, and then we have to include thanksgiving in our prayers. The first one we see is the, the word continue in prayer. Now this is a command, this is not a suggestion, this is not an option. This is actually a necessity. We cannot do this, we cannot function as, the Lord, as Paul mentioned before, unless the Lord gets into this. I tried marriage, I've said this many times, but I think it's very pertinent now. The first two years of marriage were very difficult for us, Alice and I. We couldn't understand why things weren't working the way they should. We tried to function the way Paul, the Paul teaches here, but somehow we were not doing very well. There were some times when we prayed things got better, but then immediately things got worse again. We understood that it wasn't just something that we needed, you know, praying wasn't just something we needed to do on Monday, but that we needed to do on Monday all day long, and on Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursdays, and Fridays, and as you, as you will know, all through the week. This is, this is a necessity. Here we find that it is literally a command from God. Prayer provides us with many blessings, and, you know, if we were to ask this afternoon, why prayer is such an important part of our Christian, um, in, in our relationship with God, I'm sure each one of you would probably give a, an answer to this. I've, I've, I've uh, listed several of you. Why is, is prayer such, what, uh, why does prayer uh, bring so many blessings to us? Well, first of all, imagine it is a vital part of our communication with God. Think of this. God, the Almighty God of the universe, wanting to have a relationship with you. I don't know how you see yourself, but I, when I see, when I start getting a, a, just a small glimpse of who God is, I find myself very, very small. To have fellowship with God, to have a relationship with God, would be unthink uh, unthinkable for a Muslim person. They find it impossible. You cannot have... How can an ant have a relationship with an elephant? And that would be uh, that would be an understatement. Have fellowship. God wants to have fellowship with you. I think we would need to repeat this about a hundred times before it starts sinking. I uh, probably brothers uh, brother Clay knows this man uh, back in Ireland. Brother Semesky came and visited you one time. Brother Zemeski was a missionary for 200 years, that kind of guy, you know, and he was in the ministry for, for over 40 years. And one day he, write, he wrote to me and said, Sammy, I just realized something that's amazing. God loves me. I said, wonderful, Brother Zemeski. It only took you 40 years to, to understand that. For me, it was like, where has he been the last 40 years? But it was a realization. That God wants to have fellowship with you. If we only understood this, we would be running to the Lord saying, Lord, what a privilege we have. You know, we cannot thrive as Christians unless we have communication with God. Our strength, our abilities, our enablement comes from that relationship. Prayer, brothers and sisters in, in Christ, is a priority in our life. I don't know how it was back in Luxembourg, Brother Tim, but you know, when you think of Sunday, yeah, people go to church on Sunday, that's the most important day of the, of the, of the week, but what about, did you have prayer meeting on Wednesday, maybe Thursday, and then you only see a handful of people? Ah, that's not important. But that's the lifeblood of the church, amen? Prayer is the lifeblood of the church, but we don't consider it that, and it shows, by the way, we don't attend the prayer meetings. It shows the way we have, you know, I have to be begging people to put their name for this 24-hour prayer chain. It's either that, or they like to just make the pastor um, <laughs> miserable. I, know. I try to do this, uh, invite people to get involved in the prayer chain like three weeks before we have it, and people pay no attention to that until the day before. 
Sometimes I get to think that maybe people just want to torture me. <laughs> Let's put out in there the last day just to make pastor nervous. I don't know. I don't think that's what you do, but it seems sometimes. It, it, you know, it's hard for us to say one whole hour. Yeah, just one hour. That's not really that long. Again, going back, back to that pastor's meeting I mentioned before back in California, uh, one of the preachers that got up to pray, very well-known preacher, uh, said, I've been preparing for this worldwide missions conference uh, that we want to have in the Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. I went to that, that conference. Over 3,000 people, 3,000 missionaries, pastors, and right-hand men came to that. I was one of them. I went there with my wife. And he said, I was with him, he said this man, uh, Bud Calvert, maybe you've heard of him. He said, I, I, I knew that the first thing I need to do to be able to make this a success is to pray. So I proposed to pray for one whole hour, he said. <laughs> he said, that was the hardest thing I ever had to do, pray for one whole hour. He says, I was praying out in 15 minutes. I started putting all my requests before the Lord, and I realized that all I was doing was putting like a shopping list before in front of the Lord. There wasn't any worship. There wasn't really a relationship. It was just like that, that um, a selfish little boy. He says, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. He just wants this and that, and this is the approach that he felt he was having with the Lord. He said, I really started praying 15 minutes into prayer. When I was prayed out, then I started internalizing, saying, Lord, what kind of a father am I? What kind of a, a, a husband am I? What kind of a, a pastor am I? Instead of going through these questions, then that's really when he started saying, Lord, I don't know how people in the church see me, but I want to know how you see me. And he started coming to the Lord with repentance, internalizing, getting right with God. Maybe 30 minutes into his prayer, he was, you know, really coming into this worship uh, um, uh, mode. After about an hour, he said, "I couldn't stop praying." Once he got, once he understood, prayer is the vital part of our communication. In Mark chapter one, verse thirty-five, it says, "And in the morning, rise, rising up a great while, that that means very early before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed." So simple. You know, Jesus had what I call a secret rock. I had one. It's down there in the coast. I'm not going to tell you where it is. You probably recognize it because there's a lot of tears shed on that rock. That rock is a place where I come and uh, bring everything that there is in, in Sammy before the Lord. A lot of good things have begun in that uh, as I stood on that rock and prayed. But I noticed that the real praying came when I lost myself in Him, if you understand what that means. And this is what I think, you know, before the Lord even began His day, He made sure He spent quality time with His Father. Most of the time we get up in the morning, we already have plans of what to do, maybe at 12 o'clock at night, we say, well, maybe it's time to pray. It's the other way around. We start the day with the Lord without a hurry, without um, looking at the clock, looking at the watch. It's a time for me to be in uh, alone with my Savior. So that's prayer is vital, and this is a blessing to be able to um, have fellowship in prayer before the Lord, with the Lord. One other way that we can express uh, a love for God is through, well, you know, just by coming to Him and saying, Lord, I love you. Have you ever done that before? Before you even say anything, you say, Lord, I don't want anything. I just want to tell you, I love you. And just kind of chew on that for a while. I love you. You know, when my kids used to come to me and say the first thing, Daddy, I love you, I knew they wanted something. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Gabby. Mama had just baked fresh chocolate cookies. The aroma was all around the house. Boy, did they love us <laughs> with, when that was happening in the house. 
You know when it, uh, one of your kids come to you and says, Mama, can I have some cookies? You don't feel very much loved. <laughs> There's this story I heard about a uh, grandma who knew that her uh, grandson would, you know, right after school would rush into the house and go for the chocolate, chocolate cookie a jar. And then maybe she would come and say, Mama, Grandma, I love you, bye. That kind of thing. Grandma had made sure that that jar was full of cookies, but she would she urged to see that her grandson come directly to her, saying, "Grandma, I didn't come for any cookies. I just want to hug you and tell you that I love you, not for the cookies, but because of you." Have you ever done that before? Simply come before the Lord and say, "Lord, I just want to tell you that I appreciate you, that I do love." And I'm going to show you that I love you by serving you with all my heart. We don't do that enough. <clears throat> Through prayer we can talk to the author of the Bible. This is important because it is he who wrote, who inspired the words of the Bible. So if we need help when you know, reading and understanding the Bible, prayer helps tremendously. He inspired it. He should be able to teach us. He should be able to help us understand. So spending time in prayer, helping, asking Him to help us discern Scripture is very, very important. In 1 Corinthians 2.14 it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So prayer helps us with that. In prayer, we can cast our burdens before, before the Lord. I prayed with uh, Brother Steve uh, some time ago. I realized that he was very burdened about his uh, daughter's condition. And you know, when you pray for somebody who, who's, uh, you know, battling in, inside, and you see how they pour their heart out before the Lord, it really moves you. And the Lord tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7 that he says, cast all your cares upon me because he careth for you. He actually cares for me. Can you say the same thing about yourself? You know that God cares for you. Through prayer we receive answers from God. In James chapter 4, verse 2, he says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Sometimes our prayer life is limited to about maybe five minutes, and we wear out. We close our prayer, and we get on to the real stuff in the day. Prayer is a hotline to God in our time of need. Remember Peter, when he was uh, wanting to say the Lord Jesus Christ, it was at the boat, Jesus was walking on the water, and he said, Lord, I want to go to you. Something like that. And he said, come. And he got out of the boat and he started praying something. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you will stop this wind and you stop these waves and da -da 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 for half an hour. And then please say, you know, he said, said Lord, save me. Now that's an easy verse to memorize. That's an easier one. Jesus wept. But you know, you don't have to make long prayers. These very good sounding prayers, like, you know, you're toning your voice, and you're really praying to yourself and you're praying to others. It's not about how well you choose your words, it's about how well you set your heart before Him. So, in the context of this book, the book of Colossians, the Epistle of Colossians, this command to pray like uh, uh, lightly anticipates an overwhelming feeling of doubt and fear as we consider our Christian duties. What were the duties? Husbands, we struggle to love our wives. We struggle to have a relate, proper relationship with them and we sometimes we are bitter with them. Wives have a problem and they struggle to submit uh, to their husbands as fit and as, as it is fit in the Lord. Children have a struggle. All these things that we see before the prayer, before chapter 4, verse 2, we struggle with. 
So again, Paul says, yeah, it's, it's uh, understandable, but again, you're not in this alone. The Lord wants to help you. He wants to aid you. He wants to give you the grace, the enablement to be able to function properly. So we see that it's a command, but then we need to see this the word continue in prayer. Literally, it states, uh, in prayer, steadfastly continue. We are to have her devoutedly to prayer. We are to remain at it. We are to be steadfast and faithful to prayer. Now, why is Paul again so insistent? I can think of many reasons, but I think the reason why I, the, the, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is because we have the devil who wants to devour us. Remember what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And you know, when he sees us in our prayers, he doesn't bother with us. Now, I'm sorry, when he sees us on our knees, he doesn't bother with us. He sees a Christian that is on his knees, actually, you know, pouring himself before the Lord in prayer. He sees a powerful individual that's not even get close to us. But when he sees that we can do our things things on our own, he says, that's an easy prayer. I can, I can devour him. And notice how he continues in verse 9, who resist steadfast in the faith. Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You know, the Lord is the captain of our salvation. Amen? Amen. And he needs also to be the one who fights our battles. We cannot do it on our own. And the, the devil will try to get the worst out of you. You say, how do you know about that? Because he, that's, that's exactly what he tries to do with me. And the, way, the best way he can do this is if, we, if he keeps us away from the throne of grace. He, he keeps us away from praying as we should. So the Holy Spirit inspires these words to the Apostle Paul to help us understand that grace and spiritual enablement is available to us all, all the time. So if we constantly reach out to God in prayer, in faithful prayer, He will never fail us. And it would be very hard for us to fail Him. So prayer is a lifeline to God. How many of us hold to that lifeline like everything depended on it? I think not many of us do. Notice what Second Chronicles, you know, remember the word spoken to King Asa back in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 2 Chronicles chapter 16. He says this in chapter 16, verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of, those, of them whose heart is perfect towards him. He's searching for you. But he's searching for you to have a perfect heart before him. And if he finds that, he will show himself strong. Notice the next, um, not just a command, not just, it, not only does Paul speak about precaution. Notice what he says now, watch in the same with thanksgiving in chapter 4 verse 2. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. The word watch here is, a, is to be precautious. The, the, the uh, peculiar word used here focuses on uh, the focus on attention on mindfulness, caution, and alertness rather than just staying awake. Watching is cautiously standing guard. I was chewing on this word this week, and of course, when the Lord just starts, you know, coming through, uh, you he, he kind of sh with me. This is how it works. It brings uh, memories to mind. And he brought Australia to mind. That's a lot many years ago. But some of you know that I was born in Spain, but raised in Australia. And at the age of about 10, about maybe about 12, my parents moved to uh, what we call the outback, to farmland. If you know anything about the outback, you're out there in the middle of nowhere with a lot of dangerous animals. 
Very early I learned that you don't go out for what they call a walkabout. You know what a walkabout is? <laughs> a walkabout in the Australian language is, is not just take a little walk around the, around the farm. It, it can take two, three days. You oh. Just you, you get your backpack, your machete, your long stick, and off you go. And nobody knows when you're coming back. It can be a few hours, it can be a few days. <clears throat> and um, I kind of gained my, my parents' respect when I said, I'm going to go out on a walk I said, just make sure the walk about is no more than two hours. I was 13. But you know, this is where I'm going. Going on a walkabout in the, in the outback is dangerous. Every animal wants to kill you. You come across one of those fluffy red kangaroos, they have a, a claw that are three inches long. And they pump themselves up like a bodybuilder. And they will kick your ribs open with their uh, front legs standing on their tail. Or just whip you with that, that very solid tail that they have, it might break your legs. Very, very dangerous animals. Don't get close to a wounded red kangaroo. You better run up to the first eucalyptus tree you find uh, close by. And then of course the snakes. Every snake there is poisonous. And you think, yeah, they have the biggest snakes there. It's not the big snakes you want to be watchful about, it's the small ones. After maybe one or two hours of walk, you sit down underneath a eucalyptus tree just to get some fresh air, and you might be sitting on one of the most dangerous snakes in the world, and they're only that big. And by the way, if they bite you, don't even bother to ask for help. Just sit there and die. It'll, it'll take five minutes for you to, to, to die. I mean, very, very dangerous animals. So you know what you have to learn when you go out on a walkabout? You watch! You keep your eyes open, you keep your eyes peeled, you're calm. You, it's an ongoing thing. You, 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 you go uh, into this survival mode, Every, all your instincts are awake. Because at any minute, at any turn, around any bush, you can find one of these animals and bite you. And you know that you cannot, you cannot ask for help. You think, and your mom let you go out on a walkabout? <laughs> yeah. I convinced my mom very well. But, you know, you say, well, where, where are you going with this? This is exactly what we need to do. Watch and pray. You never know when the devil will get you. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 9, it says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that, you may exalt, that he may exalt you in due time, Notice now, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about, I like that, it does sound very much like the Australian way, right? Walking about, seeking whom he may devour, who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I have you and I have the same type of, uh, of difficulty. The devil is not very original. And he doesn't have to be because his whole tricks work all the time. So he uses them here, he uses them in Australia, he uses them in South Africa, he uses them in Germany. wherever he goes, he uses the same tricks and they work. And we need to understand how, you know, how to deal with them. After, you know, when you turn 13 in Australia, <clears throat> You, you learn that you, you again, you, you develop this survival instinct. It's, a, it's something that kicks in. We are constantly alert to everything that's going on. I mean, it's, it's almost spooky. You know, this is, it's very hard to explain. Commenting on 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 9, I found an article that said this, the reason Satan is so effective in influencing humans to sin is that humans are generally unsuspecting of Satan's attacks. Those attacks come from the invisible and even who seems to be non-existent. Those attacks are subtle and come in the form of ideas, impulses, suggestions, and moods. Those attacks come in the form of baited hooks that focus our attention on the lure 
and bring us to the concealed hook. It throws this before us. And this instinct that we have, this fallen instinct, wants to bite it. That's what you want to think about it. Just, just go for it, you know. And the Lord said, because we have this tendency, this inclination, says, you need to pray constantly. You need me to help you deal with these situations. And we have to be precautious as we pray. God wants us to watch as we pray. You know this watch and pray appears seven times in the New Testament together. And uh, I think it's important that we understand why. In uh, Matthew 26, 41, the night of the crucifixion, remember what he told his disciples? Oh, you want to pray now? You want to pray with me? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit did his willing, but the flesh is weak. All right, Lord, we'll pray. And we go, we do that. I thought it wasn't important. You know what happened? Jesus went to pray. He prayed so intensely that drop the sweat were looked like drops of blood. <coughs> when he went back an hour later, he saw his disciples sleeping. And you know what happened? Right after that, temptation came in. They came to arrest the Lord Jesus. And Almighty Peter came in and said, Lord, you know, took out his sword and started doing things that Peter way. <clears throat> sometimes I think Peter was my, probably my twin brother because I feel like doing the same thing sometimes when I find temptation like that. I don't see myself very different from Peter. I don't know about you. Uh, he was very, um, um, what's the word in English? Uh, spontaneous. He's, he, he, he did think before thinking, you know, just very reactional. He, he, he just, oh, you know, just follow the heart, whatever it is. Just follow your feelings. And this is sometimes the way we do things. So, I think the lesson here for us this afternoon, if we watch that cautiously for the devil's baited hooks, we should avoid many falls. We should not struggle nearly as much with our duties if we watch more cautiously for the devil's lures. So coming into chapter 4 verse 2 and with this commandment, it makes sense, perfect sense, after we've read the duties that we have in the home. You know, when I become the best husband, when I spend time with Lori. You know, when I become the best father, and now the best grandpa, when I spend time with the Lord. When I tell people I've been married for 43 years, oh, you were lucky. <laughs> lucky has nothing to do with it. I used to think it had to do with methodology. You know, you have the right biblical methodology and everything will be no problem. It will just work out. I heard of a man who said, you know, just before getting married, he says, I'm, I'm ready for marriage and I'm ready for children. I have my method for my marriage to be a success and I have six different methods to raise my kids. He had no kids. About ten years later, he had six kids and the same people that asked him, uh, how did you make it? He says, now, now I have six kids. I don't have any methods. <laughs> I only have one. Lord, please help me. <laughs> but you know, the Lord says that in the end of verse 2, chapter 4, verse 2, with thanksgiving, including thanksgiving. That means that whatever the situation might be, don't, don't panic. Thank the Lord for it. Because He is there to help, ready for help and to help you. We will learn, I think, a valuable lesson from the old Daniel in Babylon. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before. Come on, Daniel. Are you kidding me? 
They're seeking to kill you. They're seeking to put you in a trap. They're seeking to de- 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 get rid of you. And, and you do this intentionally? I mean, you're not just praying for the nation of Israel, but you're praying, you're thanking God for this situation three times a day. Knowing that you have been, you're being uh, 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 observed, um, observado, you're being watched, they want to destroy you, and you still, I mean, at least keep the windows closed. You know, I think we have a lot to learn from Daniel. I think Daniel understood something that we fail to understand, that with God, Everything will be okay without him. No matter how prudent and wise you are, nothing will be okay. So when we pray, God wants us to be thankful. We see this several times in the epistle, chapter 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. We give thanks. Look at chapter 3, in verse 17. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And now we come to chapter 4, verse 2, and it says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same way thanksgiving. Most of the time when we go through, when we experience blessing, we thank the Lord. But how about when we go through trial, do we have enough faith to thank the Lord for that? Sometimes we shyly come before the Lord and say, Lord, I really don't understand what's going on, but since you tell me that I need to be thankful, okay, I thank you. But no, this is a, 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 a thanksgiving that's uh, produced, that's brought before the Lord because of our, because we understand that God is still in charge. He's, he's on his throne. No matter what happens, he's in charge. He knows what he's doing. He knows what trials he can bring into our life. And because we know, because we understand his character, we can thank him no matter what condition we're in. We we have to saturate our prayers with thanksgiving. We don't do it enough. We simply become very mechanical. We just pray, get it out of the way, and just move on to uh, whatever you have to do. But in this short verse, in verse chapter 4, verse 2, continue in prayer and watch the same with thanksgiving. I think we have some lessons that we can learn. One, prayer is a command. It's not an option. We desperately need to pray. And not only pray, but we need to continue in prayer. Don't break the line of communication with God. Pray without ceasing. Then we need to watch, we need to be, uh, uh, we need precaution, watching the same with thanksgiving. To watch is to be precautious. We have to be precautious as we pray. We have to include thanksgiving in our prayers. So I have several questions and I'll close this evening. Have you been praying to God for God's grace to f- fulfill your duties as a husband, as a father, as a the son, whatever the situation, as a worker, have you been praying? He said, Well, you don't know, you don't know what kind of job I have. No, I don't. But God says we can be thankful and we can trust Him. And that and, you know, we, we can call upon His enabling to help us through, be able to give a, a proper testimony as Christians. Second question, have you been watching by taking the necessary precautions so that the devil does not trip you up in your duties? Have you been really watching, keeping your eyes, the spiritual eyes open, making sure that our eyes are on the Lord? Now, third question, have you been as thankful as God wants you to be? Now, if you, if your answer to any of these questions is no, then you know what you need to do? You know what I need to do? We need to ask God to forgive us because we're not doing His perfect will. And not doing his perfect will is sin. We often talk about the sins of commission. Don't lie, you know, or uh, avoid lying, avoid uh, stealing, avoid, you know, don't just don't break the Ten Commandments. But we don't talk enough about the, the sins of omission, 
the things that we know are right and correct and are a commandment, and we don't do them and of not praying as we should, could be considered sinful. You get that? Ouch. Next week, I'll be going to the next two verses. Well, Paul says, yeah, we need to pray. It's a command, but you need to pray for me. We need to pray for each other. How often do we remember each brother by name and circumstance and pray earnestly that the Lord will work in their life? How many times do we do that? You know, if, we, if you put your name on the list and you run out of things in 50, to pray for in 15 minutes, call me. <laughs> I'll give you enough to keep you praying for 24 hours just on your own. You know, you say, well, what am I going to pray about? You need to pray for John. And be specific. That he is a wonderful husband, a, a godly husband to his wife. A godly man in society. A godly brother in the church. You need to pray for Diana. Very specifically. If you know of any areas that she needs help on, pray that God will work there. Pray for Brother Tim. Well, he doesn't need any prayer. Right, Brother Tim? Talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding, of course, but you know, you need to pray for the pastors. They carry a great burden. Sometimes they're coming to the church with a big smile, thinking, you know, it seems like they have no, no worries. As we would say in Australia, no worries. But they carry a big load. They're concerned about the things that are going in the church, going on in the church, about how things are going in the life of the people in the church. We look at these things and we, we, we feel, uh, you, uh, you know, Lord, I, I can't do anything. The Lord says, that's right. But you can come to me and pray for them. Kathy doesn't need prayer, does she? Ask her later on. Pray to Kathy, do you need anything that I can pray for you about? Be ready for a big list. Pray for each other. Each one of us here needs prayer. Do we spend the time, that, do we have the concern for the Lord to work in the life of these young people that we have here and their parents as they try to adapt to a, a very complicated Andalusia and their bureaucracy? Each of us have our own pack of needs and circumstances that we need prayer for. We need enablement. How about the people that have been visiting us? Do we pray for them? Do we spend time trying to get to know their names and maybe something about their lives and their concerns so that we can be... You know, we don't do that enough. And we should. I think, actually, it's an obligation. So you're talking about an hour of prayer. That's not enough. We need each one of us to spend 24 hours of prayer. I had a brother, a friend, a pastor, a friend of mine, he says, when I stop feeling so burdened about the ministry, I just take a big uh, bottle of maybe five gallon drum of water and nothing else, and I go take my tent, maybe take some other brother that I can count on to pray with me, and I go up in the, in the mountain and spend maybe a day or two just praying. I said, you do that? He says, yeah. I just take my Bible. A good blanket, of course, a tent, and a lot of water. And so what happens after two days of that? He says, I come back fully recharged. I might find the same problems there, but I've changed, and I can deal with the situations differently. You know where I'm going with this. We need to be become prayer warriors. The last story, and I'll finish. About 26 years ago, Brother Sammy and his wife, Melissa, and his two kids were traveling around California raising support for their ministry in Spain. We come to this little place called Vacaville. Of course, being Spanish, I understand what that means, the, the village of the cows. So there's no cows there. He says, what do you call Vacaville? Vacaville, there's no cows. He says, well, 20 years ago, there used to be many of them. I had a chance to preach in the church. There was about 150 people there. And I noticed at the end of the message that, you know, well, I'm sorry, during the, the, the service, three ladies, elderly ladies, come in 
very slowly, like this. How do you, how do you, how do you, you know, be able to sit like that? Boy, they need help. So I went on and preached. And I thought, I wonder what the Lord's going to do with this. Of course, we need the financial support. I don't remember what I preached that day. I don't remember what the other folks said, but I remember what the, those three ladies said to me. They came at the end of the service just when everybody disappeared, and they said to me, Brother Perez, you're looking for support, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. See, they looked at their two other prayer warriors, and they said, don't worry, Brother Perez, we're going to pray for you. You really need prayer. You see, <laughs> it's like almost like rubbing the, you know, like if they had a secret weapon and they said, Brother Perez, we know how get the things are done. We know how to move God into situations. And you need more than this financial support, you need prayer support, you need spiritual support. And we're going to pray for you. All right, girls? <laughs> and they walked away. And I saw that and said, I went to my wife and I told you, see those three ladies over there? You know what they call themselves? Prayer warriors. They don't like the they don't look like warriors. <laughs> but they understood. And I just wonder if we understand. Let's all stand and have a look. Dear <clears throat> yeah, Heavenly Father, we I confess, Lord, that this is the area where I struggle with most. Things come up in the day, we plan out, get those things done, and we find ourselves so frustrated, Lord, as we try to get them done. Things don't seem to go as we plan. We try to have the proper marriage relationship and then things get in the way and we don't have the proper relationship, the kind that you would want. We try to parent our kids, but we see that we have so many obligations, so many things that we need to get done, and we struggle. We struggle with work. We struggle with our bosses, with bureaucracy. We struggle with so many things that seems to weigh us down every week. And we wonder, is there really any hope? And as we've seen this afternoon, there is. You don't call us to do all those things that we see at the end of chapter 3, to do it alone. You want to step in. But you won't step in unless we, can, we, we, we come before you in the right spiritual mode. We need to understand who we are. We can't do things the way we want them to be done. We cannot succeed. We cannot advance the way we would want to advance. And when we see the struggles that we have to go through, we see then, and when then we look into the scripture, we see that We've been doing things the wrong way. We've been too, too self-sufficient. Very much like the Apostle Peter in his first stage as a, as a disciple would be. We need to learn to have a dependency on you. And Lord, I pray that you'll forgive me for the many times that I've gone on survival mode never counting on you. I pray, Lord, that you will help me remember when I get up in the morning that the first thing, the most important thing I need is to come to you and uh, confess my weaknesses and then call on your strengths and then put myself at your feet. We remember the words of the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ 
who is strengthened me. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. Some of us here this afternoon will understand how that works. We look at John chapter 15 and we see the, the parable of the vine and the branches where you come to the disciples and you tell them, without me you can do nothing. You show us there in that lesson that we need to be drawing from the sap of the vine. We need to be constantly dependent on you connected with you with in perfect um, harmony, in perfect communication. We don't have that many times. And so Lord, this afternoon I pray that you will help us put more attention to this that we call prayer. Help us, Lord, improve. Help, teach us to pray as the disciples asked you in Matthew chapter 6. Teach us to pray. It's not just bringing a few words that sound good before you. It's understanding what they mean and meaning them as we bring them before you. I pray, Lord, that you will help us this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat>